Hello, everyone. I will be um, moderating the session on how to resume the tour to North Korea. I am Young Sheik Kang, and I am uh, the chairperson of the South North Korea Exchanges and Cooperation Support Association. Uh, despite COVID-19, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, the Ministry of Unification, and uh, the staff for organizing today's session, and also the participants uh, participating online. As you are well aware, this session is titled, How to Resume the Tour to North Korea. We will be reviewing how individual tourism may be possible in North Korea and ways uh, to develop uh, the uh, tourism uh, policies and infrastructure of North Korea and we're trying to overcome the inter-Korean stalemate and uh, various creative uh, methods and uh, ways are being sought out and uh, tourism is one way that is thought to, to bring about uh, some um, breakthrough in this situation and I hope that this session contributes to improving inter-Korean relations. Uh, I would like to give you some announcements to those participating via online Online. If you have any questions, you may utilize the QR code and you may post your questions using the QR code and then I will deliver the questions to the speakers and discussants. This session provides interpretation, simultaneous interpretation. Before we begin the session in earnest, I would like to first introduce the four speakers and uh, rather the two speakers and uh, the four uh, discussants. Uh, first, we have with us uh, Professor Sang Jin Kim from Gyeonggi University and he is famous uh, for North Korea's tourism development. He worked for 26 years at Hyundai Asan Corporation. In particular, he overlooked uh, the Mount Kumgang uh, tourism project and I understand that it was uh, Mr. Professor Shin who led uh, the activity there and he also lived for four years in North Korea and he overlooked the North Korean tourism um, activities and from 2012 he is serving as a professor at Gyeonggi University. Next we will be hearing from uh, Dr. Shin. He's a senior researcher at the Korea Culture and Tourism Institute, and he has been carrying out various uh, research projects uh, at KCTI, and he has worked with various institutions such as, such as UNESCO and UNWTO, and we also have four discussants. First, we have with us uh, the Executive Vice President for National Tourism at the KTO, uh, Dr. Myung Kyung Seok Min, and uh, he uh, has uh, been an Executive Vice President of Tourism at Incheon Tourism Organization from 2010 to 2014, and uh, he established the Korean Peninsula Tourism Center as an affiliated organization of KTO in 2018 and is striving to revitalize South North Korean tourism. Next, we have the Executive Committee Chairperson of the Korean Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation, Young Dong Lee. Uh, Mr. Young Dong Lee from 1988 has been working for the Korean Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation, and he participated in various exchange programs with North Korea. Next, we have with us uh, Manager of Center for Unification and Economics at Hyundai Research Institute, uh, Ms. Hye Jung Lee. And uh, from 2018, she has been the manager of the Center for Unification and Economics at the Hyundai Research Institute. And she has worked as a member of the first term of the Northern Economic Cooperation Commission. And uh, she is also standing a member of the Democratic Peaceful Unification Committee. Recent major research topics include trends in North Korea's tourism policy, economic development, zone policies, and peaceful economy. And our last discussant has a unique background, James Banfield, Visiting Research Fellow, the Institute for Far Eastern Studies at Gyeongnam University. James Banfield. <coughs> 
has a unique background for the past 10 years, has visited North Korea for more than 30 times, and has worked in North Korea in various cap capacities, including tourism, cultural projects, scientific exchange, and aid monitoring. In addition, James Banfield also worked at Korea Tour, a travel agency specializing in North Korean uh, tours. So I will explain how we will be proceeding. We will hear, hear the two presentations first, and then the discussants will have 10 minutes to provide their discussions. And we ask the presenters to keep their presentations to within 25 minutes. Thank you very much. I am Sang Jin Shim. I was given the topic of North Korea's tourism policy and uh, the state of infra tourism infrastructure. Uh, so I have prepared a presentation. And because we're doing this online, uh, you know, there is some limitation uh, in, you know, just uh, basing my presentation uh, on the written speech. So I actually have prepared some PowerPoint uh, with more visual images. Now I will talk about the tourism policy uh, in North Korea over time and the tourism policy in the Kim Jong-un era, the tourism resources in North Korea, and then I will uh, talk about some conclusions. So over the course of the three generations, uh, the North Korean government's tourism policy policy has evolved. Under the Kim Il-sung's leadership, tourism was considered to um, uh, you know, pro as something that promotes reckless and um, uh, uneconomic living. So there was a negative view. And then under the Kim Jong-il, tourism was utilized uh, to Oh, actually, the, under the Kim Il-sung administration, uh, sometimes tourism was utilized to promote the benefits of the socialist system in North Korea. And then in 1984, the joint venture uh, laws were introduced, and the tourism business was identified as a business opportunity that could uh, lead to the formation of joint ventures uh, with external uh, investors. Um, and then under the Kim Jong-un leadership, uh, there was new uh, legislations introduced. Uh, you know, North Korea joined PATA and they designated Najin Sonbong Economic Zone, and they introduced tourism-related provisions with regards to that zone. And they opened uh, the touristic sites in a very localized manner, and they decided to uh, make money through tourism. And because they had suffered from significant economic decline over the uh, previous decade, so they tried to utilize tourism as one of the cash cow industries. And then uh, there was partnership with Hyundai Group, uh, providing uh, Hyundai Group to develop and run the touristic programs. And the uh, People's Presidium uh, would ratify this. Uh, and there was land route opened for Mount Kumgang tourism. And many civil society organizations and uh, government entities, when they were going to Pyongyang, they used to go to a uh, different route. But with this tourism open, they allowed for direct flights into the country, and so tourism in Kaesong uh, was open. And then Kim Jong-un came into power, and the policy surrounding tourism shifted significantly. One of the biggest differences is that uh, North Korea envisions building uh, economic development through tourism 
and uh, Wonsan Kalma Airport was to be newly opened, and also uh, the airline services would be improved uh, because at the time the North Korean airline was considered one of the lowest in terms of service quality, but uh, there was, uh, you know, effort to improve that, and. In 2018, at the plenary, a meeting of the Central Committee, uh, they decided that tourism would be an important pillar in uh, developing North Korean economy. And uh, plans for Ma Xingyang Ski Resort and Wonsan Kalma Seacoast Tourism Zone and also uh, the Yang Ok ok Springs and Culture Resort. These are some of the plans uh, that were shortlisted to promote North Korean tourism. During the Kim Jong-il administration, you can see that the Mount Kumgang tourism began in 1998, and then the Kaesong tourism uh, began in 2003. Uh, actually, it was approved, and then in 2007, the tourism began, and then in 2008, uh, Mount Kumgang tourism stopped, uh, and also subsequently, the Kaesong tourism stopped. Uh, so actually, these numbers I have marked in red, uh, because in uh, during Kim Jong-il administration, they were very cautious about engaging in tourism because they had never opened tourism before. So they were very cautious. They did not understand what impact this would have on the local residents. So in 2003, uh, they approved uh, the partner to Kaesong Tourism business. Uh, and then it was only five years later, uh, then the Kaesong tourism began. So every five years, there was a significant evolution of the tourism policy in uh, under the leadership of Kim Jong-il. So until the, um, the tourism eventually was suspended, at least 1.95 million tourists had visited Mount Kumgang and 110,000 people visited Kaesong. So the Mount Kumgang International Tourism Special Zone plan was already in the works under Kim Jong-il. But during the Kim Jong-il administration, they did not really work on the Wonsan zone because they were not really confident about the tourism policies. But uh, when Kim Jong-un took over, they uh, included Wonsan as part of the tourism development plan. Kim Jong-il, uh, you know, we believe uh, was really supportive of uh, tourism because they were short on, you know, um, dollars. Uh, but internally, there was a lot of resistance. And so Kim Jong-il actually had other top leaders from his uh, organ uh, government to come down and had them see uh, the possible positive outcomes uh, of the Mount Kumgang tourism. And so he actually leaves his autograph in 2000. Uh, and it says here under his signature, International Tourism Zone at Mount Kumgang. So he wanted to solidify uh, this initiative to open tourism. And so inland route, many people believed would not open, but in 2003, pilot scale uh, tourism began through the inland route. And then after the pilot operation of the road uh, in September 2003, uh, this went into effect uh, in a full scale. And then this train started to operate uh, all the way to Kaesong, and also uh, railways was open to Mount Kumgang as well. So now this is a very historical moment in March 2008. Uh, passenger cars uh, could be driven to 
have tourists visit the sites. Of course, even Hyundai groups, uh, key people did not at first uh, think this would be possible. But Kim Jong-un had the political will, and he felt that anyone from, whether it's from Busan or from Seoul, uh, you know, allowed them to enter Mount Kumgang using the passenger cars. But unfortunately, one of the Korean tourists uh, was killed, and all of this operation was suspended and frozen. And it continued to be suspended, and all of the facilities also were frozen. So now let's go back to the chronology of the Mount Kumgang tourism. In 1998, uh, the tourism first began. And then in 2008, uh, there was a tourist who died. Uh, and this was suspended. And North Korea waited for three years for this, this, uh, for this to resume. But no uh, movement was made from the South Korean part to resume. So all of the uh, people from South Korea who were there at Mount Kumgang uh, were asked to leave. And then in September 2018, at, in the Pyongyang joint statement, it uh, included a provision that says uh, con on condition there would be some normalization of the tourism. And then in November 2018, there was a joint event to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Mount Kumgang tourism uh, with people from both North Korea and South Korea attending. But still, uh, the tourism remains suspended. Now, if we look at the tourism policies in Kim Jong-un's era, there were major tourist zones constructed. There was Pyongyang Sunan International Airport, uh, and Ma Xingyang Ski Resort uh, was opened, and Wonsan Galma uh, Tourist Zone was constructed, and Baekju Mountain, uh, Samjiyeon uh, tourism zone were constructed. And there was a lot of effort to attract foreign investment. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the investment-related documents would include NPV, IRR, and uh, the future value uh, of the potential investment. Uh, but despite such efforts, because of the UN sanctions, uh, things haven't taken off to a good start. Uh, Kim Jong-un studied in Switzerland as a young student, and um, he has a strong commitment to develop its economy through tourism. And he wants to develop the Wonsan Ma Xingyong Ski Resort uh, in connection with the Mount Kumgang tourism. So he would like to have that entire zone connecting to uh, these two areas. And he wants to develop Mount Baekdu, Naseon, and Chilbo Mountain. And so basically, he wants to create this massive uh, tourism zone as a world-class touristic uh, attraction. And he also wants to uh, turn this international tourism zone into a mice hub. So he is really looking to change tourism in North Korea. Now, this, these uh, initiatives are really aligned in some ways with the Moon Jae-in administration's policies because President Moon is all for uh, economic reunification of the two Koreas, and he has presented this uh, new economic map of the Korean Peninsula. So you can see that there's a connection of all the major tourist attractions uh, in North Korea in this map. Uh, so enhancing the economic power of North Korea will lead to narrowing the gap between the two Koreas, which would reduce the reunification cost is the logic here. And as part of this effort, it is important for North Korea to uh, develop its tourism industry. Uh, and Kim Jong-un uh, seems to be uh, very compatible with uh, President Trump and uh, Time Cover actually featured them as the twins at one time. Uh, Trump has 
you know, praised uh, the North Korean leader, uh, saying that uh, he has a good chance of doing something very meaningful. Uh, and uh, Kim Jong Un also said that we no longer will have to tighten our belts uh, to his people. And the approach uh, that would make that possible was to promote tourism. And uh, something no one anticipated happened. Uh, there were major summits three times in 2018. And there were two uh, summits between North Korea and US in 2018 and 2019. And we also had President Moon delivering a speech in North Korea. Uh, and uh, the joint statement said, if conditions are ripe, the Mount Kumgang tourism would be normalized first. Unfortunately, it hasn't taken place. Uh, that was in September 2018. And five months later, uh, in 2019, uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong Un said that without condition, uh, you know, he is willing to resume the Kaesong Industrial Complex and Mount Kumgang tourism. So basically, he was willing to give up six hundred million dollars. Uh, and uh, yet, because of the international sanctions, South Korean counterparts were not able to take action. And North Korea starts to change its mind. They realize that they can't just look towards South Korea to take action. Uh, and so they, they have plans to develop mice in the Wonsan Kalma zone. And also in phase two, they talk about luxury summer houses. Um, town and that would be built in the Samirpo Hegum River area. And also there is plan to uh, build 118 kilometers of railway connecting Wonsan and Mount Kumgang. Uh, and there will be efforts to diversify the tourists uh, uh, from outside of Korean Peninsula. And in order to showcase their tourism uh, resources, they created websites uh, and it provides information on how to get visa. And if you look at uh, the contents here, they have beautiful scenery. Uh, there are many wonderful mountains. Uh, and also, there are very historical sites where the Socialist Revolution took place, uh, Panmunjom, another historic uh, site. Uh, so all of these uh, tourist attractions are featured, uh, including the Mashingyong Ski Resort. Uh, and this is under construction. So there's a lot of information on the website. But before that, this on the left, you can see this was a site of show of military forces. Uh, there were military exercises that took place. But now, if you look at the posters here, the entire party, the entire nation, and entire um, Korean people must support the, the Wonsan Kalma tourism zone. And uh, Kim Jong Un actually went to the Wonsan Kalma tourism zone uh, construction site to provide instructions at, uh, in person. The Kalma Sea Coast tourism zone has competitive potential because in South Korea, Haeundae, uh, which is the southern coast of Korea, that's uh, only uh, has a beach of 1.5 kilometers. But in the Kalma area, they have a long beach of 6.5 kilometers. Uh, and uh, you can see that some of the buildings are beginning to take shape. Now, Wonsan Kalma Airport in the past was a military airport with just a one runway. But now it's being um, transformed. So you can see here in the picture that the runways in total is around six kilometers. And in the Mount Baekdu area, they have already completed uh, several buildings here. And you can see the resort uh, in the Yang Dog uh, Resort. And Pyongyang also, the facade of, of the building has been uh, retrofitted with uh, LED screens uh, and with a smart 
smartphone application. They have a map of Pyongyang that the tourists can utilize. And also there is a very impressive video promoting Pyongyang as a tourist site. Uh, in the interest of time, I am not able to play this. But when you have time, please take a look at this video. It shows how attractive a city Pyongyang is. Uh, and in, in January 2019, Kim Jong-un said that he is willing to resume the Mount Kumgang tourism, but for 10 months, you know, no action actually took place from South Korea. Uh, and then he criticized the uh, his predecessor's policy relying on South Korea to carry out uh, tourism was very wrongly uh, uh, designed. And uh, despite uh, such uh, wish expressed by the North Korean leader to uh, leader to uh, of his wish to resume the tourism, you know, there was no uh, action taken by South Korea, and uh, uh, you know the situation worsened. Now. Uh, in these briefing statements, remarks by President Trump, it says, and you know who else has great potential? North Korea and Kim Jong-un. Uh, and um, North Korea see, sought to diversify the tourist market. And he worked with uh, Xi Jinping uh, to get Chinese tourists to come to North Korea. And in fact, many Chinese tourists uh, were actually lined up to go to North Korea according to media coverage. So they are ready to welcome the Chinese tourists because of these conditions. Uh, the population of Chinese tourists are bound to increase. So if you look at the chart on the right-hand corner, it's a um, pie chart created by Credit Suisse Global Wealth. And so in the world, uh, about 110 million people in China are able to uh, take international travel, go on international travel because their middle class is that large. And if you look at the Europe's population, EU has 512.6 million people. And they're all from different countries in different locations. But if you look at China, there's a concentration of a population of 1.4 billion people who could potentially become tourists for North Korea. And so North Korea has a ready access to uh, Chinese tourists who have ample disposable income to take tours. Uh, if you know North Korea uh, is uh, North Korea can serve as a, a as a block, uh, making effectively making South Korea a, an island. Um, so we really need to work with North Korea to uh, develop uh, the tourist tourism opportunities going forward. Now, North Korea plans to really develop the Masingyang Ski Resort. Uh, last year, South Korea attracted 17.5 million people uh, from abroad, and 28.7 million people in Korea actually went abroad to travel. Uh, now, even if we have great infrastructure, uh, and even if North Korea has great infrastructure, how are we actually going to get people to North Korea? Because right now, the Air Korea airliner only has eight flights a week. So with so few flights, it is impossible to get one million and two million tourists to North Korea, even if there was a demand. Now, Vladivostok. Uh, there are 40 flights to Vladivostok in a week. Uh, so there are 40 flights a week to Vladivostok, but on the supply of available seats are only 350,000 seats a year. So how can we actually get people to North Korea? We can utilize the low-cost uh, carriers. 
to do so. This would help North Korea and also the South Korean LCC airliners. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. But before that, let me just make one comment. North Korea has ample uh, touristic infrastructure, uh, especially in Pyongyang. And Kim Jong-un, before developing large-scale tourist zones, he really uh, wants to create the right kind of environment where the visitors can feel free to visit North Korea. And that should be the priority uh, before building any sort of massive infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shim. Those who are watching online, they were probably hoping to hear about the negotiations, which were very dramatic uh, in getting the Mount Kumgang tourism to begin in the first place. But uh, anyhow, he talked about the tourism policies and how it evolved in North Korea. Thank you very much. Uh, whether it's Ma Xingyang Ski Resort or Wonsan Galma Zone, uh, without South Korean participation, aren't those projects uh, very difficult to achieve? I think that's the message that uh, Mr. Shin was delivering. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Shin will be presenting on the individual tourism and what the strategies and challenges are. We will be hearing from senior researcher of Korea Culture and Tourism Institute, Yung Seok Shin. I will give you 25 minutes. Hello everyone, I am Yong Seok Shin, Senior Researcher of Korea Culture and Tourism Institute. I am wearing a mask and I hope that you can hear me clearly and I ask for your understanding that I am wearing a mask. In addition, my talk will be interpreted. That's why I would like to speak slowly uh, for it to be clearly interpreted. Professor Shin talked about uh, the overall uh, tourism situation in D DPRK and how Kumgang uh, Mountain tourism was carried out in the past and uh, what types of uh, uh, tourism infrastructure DPRK has and uh, its potential. What I will be talking about now will be on present issues. And uh, I want to talk about individual tourism. Before I go to the main part of my presentation, it overlaps slightly with uh, what uh, Professor uh, Shim stated. But uh, I want to explain why we have to think of individual tourism instead of the large-scale tourism, such as Mount Gumgang tourism. As you know, in 2018, we had the Inter-Korean Summit in Pyongyang, and uh, they agreed in principle on the resumption of the Mount Gumgang tour. And in the New Year's address, Kim Jong-un, chairman, stated that they would be willing to resume uh, Mount Gumgang tourism without any preconditions. So North Korea expressed their great desire for the resumption of uh, tourism, yet uh, due to the fallout of the North Korea-United States-Hanoi summit, the Mount Gumgang tourism could not resume. Uh, at the time, many people thought that uh, if the Pyongyang and Washington summit is successful that UN Security Council sanctions will be lifted and uh, that tourism can resume. But uh, due to the fallout of the summit of the US and North Korea, the uh, sanctions are ongoing and uh, uh, you might be wondering why we cannot carry out uh, Mount Kumgang tourism projects due to UN sanctions. There are many um, clauses and conditions on UN sanction in the UN sanctions and many of those um, clauses block the tourism project. The first one is related to uh, the blocking of bulk cash transfers. 
and uh, UN member countries are called upon to beware that bulk cash transfers could help North Korea avoid observing the UN Security Council sanctions. In addition, economic cooperation is prohibited according to Resolution 2375. In the height of the Mount Kumgang tourism, 200,000 South Koreans visited uh, Mount Kumgang, and uh, the payment of that would be considered as a bulk cash transfer. And uh, Hyundai Asan was the entity that was carrying out the joint venture activity, so they cannot do that anymore. Uh, therefore, such uh, project type tourism uh, projects could not be carried out. And uh, North Korea decided that they could not just rely on South Korea. And uh, so Chairman Kim uh, carried out a field uh, guidance to Mount Kumgang in 2019 October and uh, decided to destroy the facilities there and decided to rebuild it in a way that is appropriate to them. And then the next day, uh, Chairman Kim visited Yangdok. And uh, this Yangdok area was built by the North Korean military. And when visiting Yangdok, he said that it um, well, was well developed in the North Korean style and they praised the Yangdok area. So in the previous day, uh, he went to uh, Mount Kumgang where Hyundai Asan uh, developed and brought into tourism uh, into North Korea. And so uh, this shows that North Korea will now take the initiative that it will no longer rely on an entity that carries out all of the activities. And this also implies that North Korea will not wait for South Korea if there are continuous delays, that they will take the initiative. They were these warning signs. And then what took place after that was uh, that after the ordering of the destruction of the Hyundai Asan facility, what had happened was in that situation, the inter Korean relations deteriorated. So, although a destruction was ordered, that was a fall and uh, there was the seasonal issue uh, and anyway, so this was ordered, but it did not play, take place. And then President Moon. Decided that they could not just wait uh, for uh, the United States, and uh, that uh, although there are the UN security sanctions, uh, that uh, North. Korean relations should improve. And so he uh, mentioned individual tours and that individual tours to North Korea is not against international sanctions. And the Ministry of uh, Unification uh, also held a roundtable press conference on individual tourism to North Korea. Although this was announced, the following month, which was February, COVID-19 broke out. And uh, so due to such external factors, this individual tourism could not progress. And then to in 2020 June, as you know, North Korea destroyed, destructed the South, the Joint Liaison Office, and this escalated the tension between the South and North. So uh, this is the situation up to until now. Due to uh, external factors, individual tourism to North Korea Ha faces a lot of challenges. And we have been talking about individual uh, tourism to North Korea. And let's look into what it actually is. First, the Ministry of Unification, as I mentioned previously, uh, explained the concept of individual tourism. And there are four keywords that summarize what it is. It would be a method that is different from the group tourism through existing cooperative entities, meaning that it will be different from the Hyundai Asan uh, tourism project and uh, that it could be done through a non-profit organization uh, or a travel agency in a third country. And after North Korea's confirmation to invite the individual, then the person can go to North Korea. So if you look at the concept, you can read between the lines. So the sanctions says that bulk, trans bulk can cash cannot be transferred and that it should not be a joint venture. So individual tourism means that they can avoid being a bulk transfer and it's a nonprofit organization. Therefore, it's not a commercial travel. Uh, 
so the payment will not be made through entities. And it, it, because instead of a group, it's an individual, it will not be bulk cash. And yet, uh, they have to secure the security of the individuals, the tourists. And that's why they will check the um, intent of North Korea through an invitation of the individuals. And uh, the Ministry of Unification so explained this uh, concept and proposed three types of individual tourism. The first one would be visits to Kumgang or Kaesong areas uh, of uh, separated families through NGOs. Kumgang and Kaesong, these are areas that uh, Hyundai, Asan carried out, but uh, they are saying that it's humanitarian, humanitarian visits because it's of the separated families in order to avoid the um, conflict with Hyundai Asan. And they talked about other areas such as Yangdok, Wansan, and Karma. These other areas are locations where Hyundai does not have businesses. Hyundai. Uh, has secured rights in these areas accord with their seven area rights. But uh, these areas might be possible because they do not actually have businesses here, and that's why these areas have been suggested through and that these individual tours will be done through a third country. Um, DPRK does not allow individual tours. Always there has to be a DPRK guide. So it will be a small group tour. And the third country will probably be China. If a tourism product like this comes out, the Chinese tourists and Korean tourists will probably not be mixed together. It will be separated and separate tour packages for South Koreans and Chinese travelers. There are Young Pioneers Tour and Korea uh, Tour in there. Uh, announcements or notes. It says that South Korean passport holders cannot apply for this tour product. So North Korea's policy was that the tourists from North South Korea and other countries were separated. So if uh, this uh, happens, then North Korea will have to do away with their principle of dividing the tourists to Korean and non-Korean. And uh, the other uh, method is a South North Korea tour package for foreign nationals. And this is what we dream of, and this is a more long-term um, project. So for a foreigner to visit both South and North Korea, they will have to uh, ride Korea Air, go to North Korea and then go back to Beijing and then come to South Korea. So there is about a day that's lost and uh, you have to pay additional airfare. So the economics of this is very weak. But let's say uh, foreign tourists can uh, visit North Korea and South Korea and go through the border, then it'll become an attractive um, tourist product. But uh, there is the issue of uh, passing through the military demarcation line, which requires the agreement to, from the United Nations Command. But uh, on this part, there's an issue on whether or not this violates the sanction. Tourism itself uh, does not violate the sanction. So it's not about whether tourism itself is a violation. It's uh, more about uh, is this a joint venture and uh, is there bulk cash transfer. In the case of Hyundai Asan, it was a joint venture and a large amount of bulk cash was transferred. So that's a violation, but individual tourism is not a violation. However, if individual tourism uh, grows and individually there aren't a lot, but if it's all aggregated, the amount might increase. It's a very, the odds are slim. Uh, in that case, um, the more important issue uh, in individual tourism is about securing uh, about the security issue, individual security issues. We don't have any concrete plans for this yet. Uh, you can see the table, and during the Kumgang uh, tourism, Mount Kumgang tourism 
project. Initially, there was a agreement on personal security guarantees, but uh, they felt that this was not enough, and uh, that is why the Ministry of Unification and uh, North Korea's cabinet agreed on a uh, more advanced uh, agreement uh, on to the personal security guarantees. But this only applied to Kumgang and Mount Kumgang and Kaesong. If this becomes an individual tourism, though, though, then it will require different types of uh, personal security guarantees. Then how can it be uh, guaranteed? The best way, of course, would be through a summit, uh, but uh, this is not very it's not possible coming to an agreement uh, and in that case it would be through an invitation uh, that uh, the, invi the invitation will include a uh, wording that uh, the DPRK will uh, guarantee the personal security or they could receive a visa. Then uh, will individual tourism be possible and what are the challenges? We need to consider various uh, environments. Uh, first, there's the political and diplomatic uh, environment. Uh, Moon administration said that uh, they will not wait uh, for improved uh, North Korea-United States relations. But if uh, uh, the North Korea-United States relations is uh, very poor, then uh, they cannot uh, have this. It's n it won't be possible. In addition, right now, there's heightened tension uh, in the inter-Korean relations it's itself because there was the um, destruction of the liaison, joint liaison office, explosion of that office. And so uh, our government needs to take preemptive approaches. And in the first type, it was suggested that certain groups of people uh, can visit uh, North Korea. And uh, since the May 24 measures, social and uh, cultural channels uh, have been severed, and uh, it's not easy to uh, reopen these channels that have been blocked for more than 10 years. So who is going to untangle this situation? I think that the government has to uh, set the table for that. As you can see in this diagram, there are the two axes, the hostile inter-Korean relations and harmonious inter-Korean relations and uh, harmonious DPRK-US relations and hostile DPRK-US uh, relations. There's the worst case scenario, which is on the right-hand lower uh, section. So if uh, there's hostile DPRK relations with US and Korea, then individual tourism will not be possible. So for individual tourism to become uh, a reality, even if it, there is hostile uh, relations with the United States, at least there should be improved inter-Korean relations, which be a scenario two. And for us to go beyond scenario two, then the Korean government needs to make certain proposals. North Korea is not showing any official positions because the Korean government, the South Korean government, has not officially taken any action on this individual tourism. So they have to take some action. And uh, what is even worse, uh, sending the situation, is COVID-19. We're holding this uh, uh, forum without any audience, and we're all wearing masks. Uh, so in North Korea, they have blocked uh, all tourism uh, due to the outbreak uh, of COVID-19. And uh, the Yangdok Spa Resort that they had opened um, has come to a stop. Chinese tourists cannot go to North Korea. And in North Korea, during the SARS and MERS outbreak, uh, they did, because they did not have sufficient quarantine capabilities, uh, they implemented a complete uh, uh, shutdown. 
And uh, with the prolonged uh, COVID situation, uh, such um, blocks of tourism will be prolonged. And uh, the Wonsan Gaoma Coastal Tourist uh, Zone was to open in April and has been postponed uh, to October. And uh, we don't know if they will be able to open this in October. They are not saying anything about it. And uh, even if there is a diplomatic situation uh, and uh, better inter-Korean relations uh, that uh, will enable the tourism uh, with the COVID situation not improving, then uh, realistically it won't be possible. And South Korea is facing uh, the second wave at the moment. And another thing that we should consider is that uh, once this is carried out uh, the ministry of unification and other relevant part the other ministries have to be involved individual uh, tourism requires uh, there were um, conflicts uh, on whether controversies and whether this requires like approval from the united states or not uh, even if it's not an approval, at least they, there should be some level of consent. And there has to be some discussions on this via the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And if this uh, deals with a third country a travel agency, then there will be a Korean a travel agency that uh, serves as a middleman. And in that case, how will the Korean tourist uh, be managed? And this is an area that the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism has to deal with. And uh, let's say for the improvement of inter-Korean relations, um, the separated families and uh, cultural groups, uh, if they are to visit uh, North Korea, uh, what will be the quarantine for such tourists? This uh, will have to be, uh, this will require the involvement of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. And uh, also, uh, we might have to go through the MD and in that case, the Ministry of Defense has to sort this out with the United Nations Command. And individual tourism, this is a uh, alternative and a bypass to the uh, halt of the Mount Kumgang project. Yet uh, it's not easy to address. And uh, thinking about this from a working level uh, situation, the Political situation at the time was much better than now, and uh, Hyundai Asan, that had uh, relations with uh, North Korea for the past 10 years, uh, served as the middleman, and they gathered the tourists uh, and two to three days prior to the um, trip, uh, they would uh, utilize the Ministry of Defense uh, to notify the UN command, uh, and uh, that's how they uh, did this. It was a process. But in that, in the case of individual uh, tourism, who is going to take on this role? Will the Ministry of Unification uh, create a system like this? If you go into the uh, details and uh, uh, there are so many things that need to be sorted out. And uh, individual tourism, you don't have a counterpart. In the Mount Kumgang project, there were two partners associated, Hyundai Asan and uh, uh, the counterpart in uh, North Korea, Korea Asia Pacific Peace Committee. Uh, but in the individual trips, it, it's the masses. And uh, now they are talking about uh, three channels. That's possible. So we don't know exactly what the channel will be. So the management issue is not uh, such an easy matter. Therefore, if something like this would be carried out after COVID-19, and uh, let's say uh, the Mount Kumgang uh, tourism project cannot be carried out and individual trips have to be considered as a alternative. There has to be thorough preparation and a thought, a thought process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shin. Uh, thank you for keeping to the time. Uh, through the, through uh, Dr. Shin's uh, uh, dis presentation, I think uh, we understand what we need to discuss. So in 2018 summit, uh, there was the 
decision to resume tours, and then there was a 2019 New Year speech of uh, Chairman Kim Jong Un. But uh, due to the uh, UN sanctions, we are not progressing with this, and so there are some areas of conflict. As uh, you have said, we need to find creative ways to overcome uh, this situation, and individual tourism is one uh, way to do that. If individual tourism is um, successful, I think it will lead to exchange of North Koreans and South Koreans. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Shin said, it will not be easy because it will require overcoming uh, various hurdles uh, such as UN sanctions, COVID-19, uh, and uh, the various ministries that have to uh, overcome these difficulties together. And uh, we will now hear from the discussants to share their uh, experiences. And uh, one thing that I was surprised about Dr. Shin's uh, presentation was uh, that uh, that the uh, culture and uh, the career culture and tourism Institute uh, is under the Ministry of uh, Tourism and uh, Culture. So uh, you stated that uh, the Ministry of uh, Sports, culture, and tourism has to take on a very important role uh, in uh, making this possible. And so I think uh, you uh, stress the responsibility of uh, the ministry. We will now go on to the discussion. We will begin from the right-hand side. We ask you to uh, keep your remarks within 10 minutes. We will hear first from uh, Dr. Min and then uh, Shin and uh, Lee and uh, Lee Shin Lee Lee and uh, uh, James and uh, then we will receive questions from uh, the online participants and ask them to the speakers and discussants. First, we'll hear from Mr. Min. Good afternoon. I am from the Korea Tourism Organization. My name is Kyung Suk Min. Um, Professor Shim and um, Dr. Shin have provided very clear and in-depth presentations, so I would like to make some complimentary comments. A couple of days ago, Minister In Young Lee uh, delivered an opening speech, and uh, he used the word CVIP, so complete, verifiable, irrevocable uh, peace. So that was the concept that he proposed. And at this point in time, I think it's a very inspiring concept and timely concept to propose. Right now, denuclearization, is it a goal or is it a means? Uh, that kind of uh, debate has taken place. But uh, oftentimes, denuclearization has also been seen as an obstacle to improving relations with North Korea. But ultimately, Minister Lee was saying that peace should be the ultimate goal, not uh, uh, peace uh, should be the ultimate goal. So he proposed the concept of CVIP. And uh, through that concept, he was delivering a very strong message for cooperation for the two Koreas. Now, with regards to the individual tourism or independent tourism, there have been many, um, you know, stories coming out, but no real progress was made because DPRK was not really open to the idea. So we have just been muddling through without getting real progress. And then on top of that, there was, of course, the COVID-19 outbreak and floods and other natural disasters that have uh, come one after the other. So we have uh, been uh, getting the stumbling blocks thrown at us, um, you know, over the time. Uh, and in such difficult times, I hope South Korean government sh could boldly and consistently make a meaningful proposal so that um, talks can continue. And especially the in individual tourism, the whole idea is, I think, very timely and very meaningful. And although this would probably have to begin on a pilot scale, I think this would be a new uh, step forward for cooperation in tourism between the two Koreas. In order, if we are able to achieve success uh, in 
individual tourism, I think it can create a great momentum for strengthening inter-Korean cooperation, and it could also uh, provide a nice foundation for building peace on the Korean Peninsula. If we go ahead with the individual tourism, we could refer back to, of course, the limitations uh, that took place when we had the Kaesong tourism and Mount Kumgang uh, tourism. Uh, the limitation was that that uh, people could not really break out of this limited sphere that was uh, allowed on a restricted basis uh, for the tourists to access. Uh, but if we really are able to go through with this uh, individual tourism, we could even have tourists go to Pyongyang, Shiniju, and we would be able to, we should be able to expand uh, the sites uh, for tourists to access. And so we should promote this as a tourism that is more free in terms of scope and access. And if that is set as a goal, and if that goal is achieved, I think there will be a great momentum for tourism industry both in both countries. Uh, now, we've been talking about inter-Korean tourism, having South Korean tourists going to North Korea, but as Mr. Shin mentioned, we could also think about, uh, you know, uh, outside tourists to uh, go into North Korea, connecting South and North Korea. So, you know, Kaesong tourism and tourism in Mount um, Kumgang was always seen uh, as a tourism program with South Koreans going unilaterally to North Korea. But in terms of creating a unification of the economic sphere in the peninsula, uh, perhaps we should really seek to attract international travelers to maybe come to South Korea and then through uh, the border go to North Korea. Or we could have international travelers going from China to North Korea and then to South Korea. So we could have this trilateral kind of a tourist uh, package uh, that we could envision. Uh, last year at the Korean Tourism Organization, uh, made some estimations. Uh, so by 2025, if we are able to link uh, the two Koreas through tourism packages, we could have 2.5 million tourists coming to Korean Peninsula. Uh, uh, so um, this is a significant estimation. So in that sense, connecting the two Koreas in a uh, tourism package or a tour could be a great model to pursue. So we need to really study this opportunity and uh, even to make progress on this idea. Uh, the individual tourism uh, to in North Korea, I think it requires one key uh, prerequisite. In North Korea, the tourists should be guaranteed safety and security, and North Korea needs to present itself as a normal state that can ensure and guarantee the safety of the tourists visiting. Uh, when the Kumgang Mountain tourism uh, was uh, suspended, it was because one of the Korean South Korean tourists died, uh, and Hyundai Asan and the North Korean counterpart, when they began this program, there was support from the South Korean government. And so there was some instability in the way the uh, the parties got involved. And so the line of responsibilities were uh, sometimes unclear. And so that ended up in a suspension of a very important program. But uh, by having DPRK really officially present itself as a normal state so that people can feel safe going to North Korea, uh, you know, we could make this opportunity real. Uh, so, you know, this would require, of course, invitations from North Korea and, um, you know, visas. Uh, but in addition to that, I think we need to really have some sort of an agreement uh, on ensuring the safety of the tourists between the two Koreas. Uh, and we need to think about who's going to lead this. Kim Jong-un, 
is very committed to use tourism as a means of developing its economy. And there was significant policy shift under Kim Jong-un leadership. For example, there was special Mount Kumgang Zone Act. Uh, and so there was a strong commitment shown through this act. And as Mr. Shin mentioned, through the websites and videos and applications, and even on YouTube, DPRK is really f showcasing their tourism resources. And in that sense, the, you know, North Korea is really taking on the initiative in developing its tourism. So in that sense, the Ministry of Culture and Ministry of um, uh, unification and so the South Korean uh, ministry should also kind of talk together and divide uh, roles and responsibilities to make clear R&R in order for us to pursue this on a sustainable basis. And with regards to Mount Kumgang and Kaesong, perhaps we could create some sort of a committee uh, between the two Koreas. So from South Korea, we could have maybe Hyundai Asan or Korea Tourism Organization or Ministry of uh, Culture or Unification getting involved. And from North Korea, the Asia Pacific Committee uh, or the relevant ministry there could come together to have an inter-Korean tourism cooperation committee to discuss visa issues or the procedures for entry across the border or safety and security issues. And uh, when foreigners actually go to Pyongyang or Kaesong, you know, how uh, the procedure will be to allow that to happen. So we need discussions. And as Dr. Shin mentioned, uh, it's a long way before all of that can be resolved. But uh, if we take step-by-step -step approach and build trust along the way, we will be able to facilitate tourism between the two countries and also involving international travelers. Um, and with regards to travel cost, uh, there was the issue of the bulk cash transfer. So I'd like to touch upon that a little bit. Although Dr. Shin uh, mentioned this extensively, uh, when tourists individually pay fees to uh, North Korea, then there is no issue of bulk cash. But uh, let's say the border crossing fee or mountain entry fee and accommodation uh, fee that can be paid individually. But uh, when, when this is done individually, uh, there may be some hassle and confusion. So maybe North Korea should create various points of payment transactions so make this very uh, hassle-free. I think that would make it more convenient and safe for tourists. Initially, we could not have you know large numbers of tourists coming in at the same time from the beginning. Maybe perhaps we could have up to 200 people per uh, tour. Um, and uh, gradually increase that number over time, I think we could make this uh, work smoothly. Finally, I'd like to add uh, one more comment. Uh, in order for this to be sustainable, we uh, need to see DPRK really managing the quality of their uh, tour offers. Right now, the Chinese are traveling uh, most uh, to North Korea. Uh, but uh, when individual tourists from South Korea visit North Korea, we, you know, there needs to be some sort of measures uh, when unexpected accidents or things happen. Uh, so if there's a, some kind of support center for tourists, so if there's a tourist support centers in Pyongyang or Wonsan, or if they were pro traveling through China, maybe in Tandong or Beijing, if there's some sort of uh, medical facility support providing emergency support to tourists suffering from medical issues in North Korea, I think that could really help. And in the case of international travelers, the Korean tourism organization is really fit focused on attracting international travelers to come to South Korea. Uh, I believe once this is opened, uh, there are many uh, tourist uh, products and packages uh, that will uh, be launched. So when there should be some sort of a certification of tour packages uh, when maybe South Korean travel agencies work with Chinese travel agencies to provide package tours. So if some sort of an accident occurs or if there are exorbitant uh, fees levied on the tourist, uh, you know, there might be a lot of problems occurring. So maybe we could have some sort of tourist package certification to, uh, for the consumers to guide the consumers to make the right choice. Um, and perhaps we could have uh, even a dedicated 
dedicated travel agency assigned uh, to um, for effective admi administration of these package tours. Uh, uh, I mean, the independent tours. And um, North Korea sees tourism as a means of developing its economy. And in terms of the hardware infrastructure, they have established that somewhat. Uh, but if we, therefore, approach from the hardware support perspective, this is not going to be effective. So we really need to uh, make suggestions that is attractive to North Korea. Because you know, on the hardware infrastructure side, North Korea should take the initiative and they should develop it. But South Korea could potentially uh, support uh, this from a software uh, perspective. So North Korea is lagging behind in terms of providing services. So maybe the North Korean service personnel uh, could be trained and we could maybe build a training center for service personnel. Maybe uh, Pyongyang a Tourism University could be in a partnership relations with a training institute in Korea, uh, South Korea, could provide effective training for service personnel. Uh, and so I think um, that could be an idea. Most importantly, uh, there, I think it would be effective to have some marketing done uh, with two Koreas involved. So in Beijing or in Vietnam, you know, they have like expos and trade shows. Maybe we could have North Korea and South Korea together promoting uh, tour packages involving both Koreas. I think that would be very attractive. Uh, and the reason why I've been talking about, you know, tours linking uh, both Koreas uh, this would be a very unique offer for international travelers outside of the peninsula because in a ve on the one hand, uh, they could visit South Korea, which has achieved significant economic growth in a short time. Uh, and at the same time, the international travelers could see the mysterious, uh, you know, sides of North Korea. That would be a very attractive offer. And... Uh, Right now, we are in a very uh, difficult times, but this offer could be could provide us with a breakthrough. Uh, with that, I would like to end my discussion. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Min. Korean tourism organization, you actually have assets that have been seized by North Korea, right? So that's about worth 90 billion Korean won. Yes, yeah, so I guess you really need to get that back. But anyway, uh, you made important comments. The individual tours could be could serve as a barometer to gauge how relations between the two Koreas have thought. Uh, on the other hand, it's not uh, just whether or not this is offered. I think it's very important to have this done on a sustainable basis with quality control. I think that's what you really wanted to say. Uh, so if we are able to work on this, maybe uh, five years later, you estimated that we could actually have about 2.5 million people visiting the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I, I wish that would that were true. Uh, we could actually have Seoul Pyongyang Olympics uh, even. So so it's a dream and it's a vision. I think it's very inspiring. And as an expert in tourism, uh, it's important to uh, have this offer available. But at the same time, the sustainable quality control, I think, would be very important. <coughs> oh, and uh, Mr. Yong Dong Lee, you can provide some discussions. Uh, I listened with great interest to the very good presentations of the two speakers. And I would like to also add my uh, contributions to build on their presentations. As you know, uh, you know, Mount Kumgang is the major tour offer. And in 2012, we visited Kosong County to understand uh, what kind of losses or damages they suf suffered as a result of the suspension of the tour. And I, we interviewed a lot of the residents there, and uh, you know there was a lot of despair and disappointment. According to the survey, the Kosong County 
uh, suffer is suffering 3.1 billion uh, won of loss per month. And uh, there was a very interesting data coming from 2007 when Mount uh, Kumgang tour was in its peak, the tourists visiting Goseong County was 7.2 million. But right now, Goseong County's population is 30,000 people. So at the time, 7.2 million tourists visited when there was a population of 30,000 only. And then when this tour was suspended, 2 million tourists reduced. Uh, Goseong County has the Unification Observatory, which is a tourist uh, attraction. And from and on the observatory, you could actually see the cars that were traveling up to the Kumgang Mountain. And you could also get the view towards the Mount Kumgang. In 2008, the number of tourists visiting that observatory was 1.85 million. But last year, it was only 730,000 people. So more than 600,000 people uh, declined uh, in terms of the number of tourists visiting this observatory. And so the many people talk about Mount Kumgang tour and uh, they you know people see this as pouring US dollars to North Korea but actually uh, tour in North Korea is beneficial to North Korea of course but at the same time it had been providing benefits to the South Korean uh, residents as well so uh, North Korean tourism is a tourism that really helps uh, benefit both Koreas. I think we need to really remind ourselves of that. And uh, in Moon Jae-in administration in 2018 and 2019, uh, there were two opportunities in 2018 to visit, and then in 2019, one uh, visit. Uh, and uh, I think February 2019, was the last opportunity to actually enter uh, Mount Kumgang. I actually took those opportunities to visit Mount Kumgang. Uh, and it was interesting that the uh, vehicle passage uh, was actually allowed at the time. But over time, uh, this access was uh, very restricted. If we go back in time, we went to Mount Kumgang and we stayed at the hotel and we would visit Samilpo. Uh, and at different points along the road, there were stalls set up by the residents. And when we are coming back, these residents would set up stalls at a different point on the road to sell their wares to the tourists. And we could see that they were very uh, active and they ab about um, the Mount Kumgang tours. It was just over one night, but uh, some of the uh, very popular wares were sold out at the hotel. And I bought something at Samilpo. And I saw that uh, it was made of herbs produced in 2006. Uh, anyway, when the Mount Kumgang tour was suspended in 2008, the products uh, that had been produced for the uh, future tourists had been sitting in the warehouse since, waiting for South Korean tourists to come again. Uh, and so we really need to uh, continue um, uh, looking into these opportunities and, and trying to resume this. Uh, Mr. Shin was saying that in order to pursue individual tourism, we first need to normalize inter-Korean relations. And I agree to that. But a and to have, a, 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 and as a prerequisite to normalizing inter-Korean relations, I think first we really need to normalize uh, Korea-US relations because Right now, uh, outside of going through a third country, the 
to be able to have tour offers going through the DMZ, we really need to be freer from the UN command's inter Vention, because right now the UN command is intervening uh, in significant ways. In 2019, the Korean government wanted to provide Tamiflu, this medication, to North Korea. But at the end of the day, we were not able to get the Tamiflu across the border to North Korea because Tamiflu could be transported across the MZ. But the vehicles carrying the Tamiflu uh, was under UN sanction. Therefore, we cannot have the Tamiflu uh, cross the border. So that was what happened. And North Korea, seeing this, thought that the South Korean government is not really sincere about cooperating in economic terms. And they really um, got that sense uh, from this failure of uh, the uh, provision of Tamiflu. And then there was uh, some investigate studying uh, that was being done to uh, look at the Gyeonggi Railway. Uh, and again, the UN command intervened because in order to cross the DMZ, uh, a application had to be made 40 hours before, 48 hours before the attempted entry. But, uh, uh, you know, the Korean government had uh, submitted an application 24 hours before the attempted entry. So on that account, UN command uh, disallowed this. Uh, so that's an example of the UN command's interventions uh, that were not helpful. And uh, in February 2019, I went to a, an event that took place in Mount Gumgang. In 2011, when a similar event took place, the Korean presses, uh, laptops, and cameras uh, were allowed across the border. Of course, they created a uh, formatted uh, laptops uh, to do that. So, but anyway, that was allowed nevertheless. But in 2019, because of the sanctions, the press core could not take their cameras across the DMZ and also the laptops are not allowed, even for the staff uh, who are part of the organization of this event. And so without the camera, without laptops, we had to uh, go to North Korea to participate in this event. So I'm listing out these examples because at each event and at each opportunity, if United States were to intervene in this way, uh, you know, if we are to pursue individual tours under such circumstances, it would be very difficult. Uh, and according to the Armistice uh, Treaty, DMZ's jurisdiction is with the UN command. So in order to enter the DMZ, we have to get approval from the UN command. And in order to pass through the DMZ, again, the UN command needs to approve. Uh, in 2007, uh, on the October 4th statement, then President Romu Hyun went through DMZ to Pyongyang, and at that time, the he, you know he he was the president of South Korea, and yet he had to get approval from the UN command to actually cross into North Korea. So you know this is our soil, but our jurisdiction is undermined uh, 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 when it comes to the DMZ. Uh, of course, uh, we have to respect the Armistice Treaty. So if it's m for military purposes, we should respect that. But if it's non-military exchange, should the UN command exercise such stringent restrictions? Because if they do continue to do so, this would hinder individual tours connecting South and North Korea. So we need to uh, get this uh, problem solved very quickly in order for anything to take place. And then uh, the Korea-US working group, uh, they are were also, uh, you know, they could also uh, 
disallow uh, the transport vehicles crossing the border uh, when we're trying to deliver aid. But, the, you know, the civil society organizations uh, are very critical of this because they thought U.S. Rock Working Group was there to facilitate cooperation, but now they're serving as um, a stumbling block. Uh, and so if such Interven negative interventions continue, you know, this is not right. So maybe Korea should uh, drop out of the U.S. ROC working group or we could disband the working group altogether in order to facilitate uh, this type of tour. And uh, Dr. Shin uh, made some comments about the actual um, work involved. And he was saying who should take on the administrative um, uh, processes that Hyundai Asan had taken, uh, was responsible for in the past. Well, uh, I think the Inter-Korean uh, Exchange uh, Association uh, could take on that role because this also involves the entry procedures uh, across the border. Uh, and also he mentioned that if the number of tourists increase, there could be some risk of um, this being considered a bulk cash transfer. Uh, in 2007, when we had a peak in the tourism in Kumgang, uh, there was only 400,000 um, people a year. So we believe that the estimated individual tourists, if this were to take place, would not be more than uh, several tens of thousand uh, people. And in China, about 200,000 tourists visited North Korea a year. Uh, uh, so I don't think we need to worry so much given these low numbers. Finally, in order to have successful individual tours, we really need to have the UN command and the US to make some allowances on non-military um, travel. Thank you very much. Us, you know, you have shared a lot of uh, experience uh, you had as a member of the civil society organizations. You know, there were agreements reached between the two leaders in Korea to enhance exchange and cooperation. Basically, that means exchange of goods, uh, supplies, materials, and also people. Uh, we have Kyungi Railway, we have, uh, you know, inland routes available. So in order for us to utilize these infrastructure, we really need to have UN command to uh, maybe give up the jurisdiction on the non-military uh, crossing of the borders to the South Korean uh, authorities. I think that was your uh, request. Uh, although the UN command, uh, it's actually led by the US, not really the UN. But anyway, basically, therefore, uh, you are saying that the US should make amends uh, or, or make allowances. So right now, you know, we are streaming this and a lot of questions are coming in. So we would have to move very swiftly to cover all these questions. So uh, Ms. Lee. Hello, everyone. I am Hye Jung Lee from uh, the Hyundai Economic Research Institute. Uh, thank you for inviting me to learn from the experts in this field. We are speaking about tourism, and uh, tourism is a uh, central theme for both leaders of the North and South, and it was discussed during the Inter-Korean summits in 2018, and there were uh, some agreements on this. Now we have to talk about uh, concrete ways to resume the tourism of the two Koreas. President Moon stated that it does not go against the UN sanctions, and on this, I think, already the other speakers explained. Uh, and uh, during the opening of the National Assembly this year, uh, President Moon talked about uh, peace economy and he mentioned uh, Kaesong and uh, Mount Kumgang. And uh, Dr. Moon talked about uh, peace economy and the importance of tourism in peace economy. Since 1998, with the Mount Kumgang uh, tourism, uh, 
If we look back, there was economic cooperation, and during the, those times, South Korea underwent economic difficulties due to the Asian financial crisis. We had to find a way to break through from our economic difficulties and uh, the peaceful uh, Korean Peninsula at the time, I feel uh, greatly contributed to economic development of South Korea as well. And due to COVID-19, both Koreas are feeling the impact and uh, North and South both can uh, recover uh, the economy through tourism, and I think that uh, such tourism can lead to the improvement of the two Korea's economy, and I feel that it's very timely and significant that we're discussing the matter of tourism at this se in this session. North Korea is stressing the importance of tourism, and we can see that in various areas. Chairman Kim Eun-jung goes to field um, uh, field visits, and uh, depending on the frequency of his uh, field visits, we can see the importance of that industry. In 2017, it was only one time. In 2017, it was one time. But in 2018, it was 10 times. And then in 2019, it was 11 times that he went out for uh, tourism field uh, visits. And uh, it shows that in North Korea's economy, which was hampered due to the UN sanctions, are emphasizing the importance of tourism as a way to overcome uh, their difficulties. Uh, due to COVID-19, North Korea's economy overall has been de uh, dealt a blow, and I think the area that uh, felt the blow the most was tourism, and uh, others to talked about uh, the difficulty of developing uh, tourism uh, due to COVID-19, and uh, right now, Chinese tourists cannot enter North Korea, although there were a lot of tourists that had gone to North Korea from China and uh, Wansan Kalma also the opening and completion date has been postponed such as Dr. Shin said uh, originally it was supposed to be completed by April 15th and it has been postponed individual tourism uh, we are having discussions on this, and for us to over uh, to implement individual tourism, uh, there were many conditions that have to be met, and it was explained by various uh, speakers. Uh, for the external factor that has to be overcome, it's the UN sanctions. So, without violating the UN sanctions, what are some ways that we can? Uh, implement individual tourism. International sanctions, it excludes humanitarian aid, and there are certain areas that can be excluded, and tourism can uh, be excluded to a certain extent, and so we need to think about ways to uh, do this, and we also need to have consensus in South Korea. Uh, sustainable uh, inter-Korean uh, tourism industry development. Uh, many people stress the importance of that, but for us to enable this, we have to secure some sort of consensus within South Korea. And for this, there has to be guarantee of the assets of the investors, and uh, there have to be guarantees of the tourist security. These are all prerequisites. And uh, another thing that we need to be mindful of is the COVID situation. Um, and so in this situation, how are we going to carry out inter-Korean exchanges and cooperation? According to the summit, uh, there were discussions on uh, exchanges for quarantine and uh, quarantine measures and development of quarantine measures. So already we had an agreement on this and this crisis, COVID-19, might serve as an opportunity because it can be used uh, to overcome uh, the stalemate. Uh, so the security issue might be resolved through COVID-19 because we can start discussions about uh, addressing this, uh, the COVID-19. And uh, so what are some tourism activities that can be carried out uh, despite these sanctions? There is the volunteerism, and it is a compound word of volunteer plus tourism. So it's volunteerism. And uh, 
COVID-19 quarantine and uh, improving water quality, protecting the environment uh, and protecting the uh, ecosystem, there can be some uh, tourism uh, products uh, on this. And if you look at uh, the uh, study of North Korea, they are stressing uh, ecosystem, ecotourism, ecotourism, and uh, the major uh, researchers in North Korea, uh, if you look at the papers that uh, they have uh, uh, published, they say that uh, ecotourism is an industry that uh, can bring in revenue without much investment because ecotourism uh, does not require a lot of investment in the tourism facilities. So they feel that it might be one of the most effective uh, tourist products for North Korea, this ecotourism. And uh, on the tourism, there can be some academic exchange, which will avoid violating the sanctions. This came out in other sessions. A session like this, a uh, online conference, can be carried out with North Korea on the um, academic ex exchange in the area of tourism. And this was mentioned in another session. Uh, North Korean researchers, if you look at it, their uh, results, they are talking about uh, utilizing virtual reality to experience uh, tourism. And there is some study into that already in North Korea. So VR tours can uh, become an area of academic exchange between the scholars in tourism. Um, in addition, we can think of having a international conference like this online with other countries included, such as China, and uh, an international tourist um, tourism um, products can be showcased together, uh, and uh, inter-Korean uh, tourist products can be connected in North Korea on tourism, the awareness and uh, recognition is changing with the Kim Jong-un era. With uh, Dr. Min, I went, I visited uh, North Korea and compared uh, to when I went previously and in 2018, I felt a difference. They have become more sophisticated and uh, it seems that they are more uh, tourist friendly. And uh, when I came back, I looked at uh, into what uh, things that they did and uh, they went to, to China and uh, they learned. So they learned how to be more uh, consumer friendly, tourist friendly uh, through experiencing the services in China. And uh, I also looked at some magazines in the United, rather, uh, DPRK, and uh, uh, they talk about uh, being closer to the market, attracting European tourists, and uh, also uh, targeting Asian tourists. And they seem to be thinking about marketing uh, and uh, trying to create marketing that is uh, tailored to their target market, such as Asia and uh, Europe and on the inter-Korean tourist products and the importance of that and the need for this. This has already been dealt by other speakers, so I'll just be brief. Uh, just as Dr. Shin said, if we, we don't right now have a direct flight to, to North Korea, so foreign tourists, for them to visit both South and North Korea, they have to spend a long time and uh, it is expensive. So many people uh, talked about how this can be overcome and if those problems are solved uh, if it is possible for foreign tourists to uh, cross through the MDL, uh, then we can have uh, tourist products that connect North Korea's Kaesong, Kosong, and uh, South Korea's Kosong and Paju. And uh, also, we can utilize uh, foreign uh, tourist agencies to facilitate uh, these products. Foreign tourist uh, travel agencies, they have some products, but and they're very similar. And they show similar patterns in the products that they provide. They uh, enable looking around various uh, tourist spots in North Korea. Then they take the tourists to uh, Beijing, and then they go to Gyeongju, and it follows the Gyeongbu line. In the future, if we can have the uh, um, the travel that uh, allows for tourists to cross through the DML, uh, then they can visit Gangwon province, 
because they will go through Gangwon and did the Wonsan Kalma International Airport and Orang uh, Airport might be used. The North Korean authorities want to utilize these local um, airports, and we may also uh, connect to our own local um, airports. In addition, we can develop theme-based uh, tra travel products uh, around the border area uh, at Kaesong Industrial Site. We can think of a Kaesong Peace Tourism. The Kaesong Industrial Area had a first, second, and third phase development plans. And in the second and third development phase, it included developing tourist uh, spots. So the industri Kaesong Industrial Complex can in the future be used as uh, tourism hotspots. And uh, on the um, inter-Korean uh, tourism products, uh, there can be some products uh, centered around food and cuisine. According to a survey carried, about, carried out by Korean Tourism Organization 2018, Foreigners, when they were visiting South Korea, 63% were because of shopping and 57.9% were because of food. And in North Korea, too, they have tours on the cuisine of North Korea and uh, beer breweries in North Korea. Uh, and so the various uh, food culture of the South and North Korea can be uh, utilized as products, tourist products, and uh, they can be promoted. Uh, on Yangdok, uh, the spa, many people uh, stress the importance of the spa. And uh, South and North uh, both are interested in wellness and uh, medical tourism. Uh, wellness tourism can be used as a connected uh, tourism product for North and South. This is also an area that we can look into. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, talked, uh, presented, provided a discussion in the previous session too, and she is now talking about various interesting themes. Uh, sorry that we could not give you more time. Uh, finally, Mr. James Banfield, uh, please provide your discussion. You're going to do this in English, uh, so you can listen to the interpretation. Uh, uh, Ten minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kong. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, once again, my name is James Banfield. I am a visiting research fellow at Kyungnam University's Institute for Far Eastern Studies. Uh, previously, I've worked about five years of my life um, arranging tours to North Korea for a foreign travel company. I've arranged a couple hundred independent tours. And I think that Dr. Sheen and Dr. Sheen have uh, provided a very complete view of the environment in North Korea today and the potential directions for individual tourism in North Korea. Um, among their points, I'd like to highlight three that I think are especially important for the success of individual tourism to North Korea. Um, first, I would like to stress uh, the importance of medical infrastructure and uh, kind of echo what other speakers have said about security. And I think medical infrastructure and medical response is especially important for South Korean tourists, um, many of whom may be from a relatively older demographic than the traditional European or Chinese tourists you might see in uh, North Korea. Um, also, South Korean tourists may visit in potentially large numbers, I hope. And uh, they would also likely visit areas such as Kaesong and Mount Kumgang, which are far from the medical facilities in Pyongyang and actually relatively closer to Seoul, at least uh, transport-wise. So I think, again, echoing what other speakers have said, um, especially given the sensitivity of the DMZ area, uh, there needs to be a reliable and rapid mechanisms for medical care, including uh, established emergency protocols, uh, clear lines of communication 24-7, uh, insurance policies, medical evacuation, and potentially basic clinics in North Korea for South Korean tourists. Um, I like the idea that Vice President Min mentioned about um, having some kind of service center uh, in the country. Um, second, I would like to highlight uh, human resources as a kind of infrastructure and potentially the most important kind of infrastructure. Um, in my experience in tourism in North Korea and other projects, um, People and relationships are key to the success of any project, and that goes including the North Korean side and their counterpart side, whether they be South Korean or foreign. Um, and this kind of expertise with North Korea and trust with North Korean counterparts 
Uh, that takes time to develop. It takes time and effort. Um, I would say it takes time on the scale of years to develop. Uh, so I kind of want to raise the question of how can we maintain actually South Korean human resources related to North Korea in such a volatile environment, and especially among younger people um, and at the working level. So younger people at the working level whose career may be, you know, 20 or 30 years from now still working with North Korea. Um, and again, ask this question, what happens to their expertise and the relationships they develop if suddenly North Korea closes? So I, I think um, we need to have some follow-up with the human resource in South Korea and also the regions of South Korea that border uh, North Korea, as I think uh, Chairman Lee mentioned, they took an economic hit. Um, thirdly, I think it is extremely important to focus on the experience of South Korean tourists, um, both before and after the tour. Um, working in North Korea, uh, the North Korean tourism professionals, especially over the last couple years, are extremely capable. They are very good at problem solving and providing a good experience mm -hmm. to visitors within the North Korean context. Um, so I think really our job is to prepare our tourists, whether they be South Korean or um, international tourists, for that context. Um, so I think before the individual tour, uh, it's critical that the rules and guidelines for travel to North Korea are very clearly um, told to the tourist. And I think it's very important that these rules are consistent across the North Korean uh, the South Korean organizer, North Korean partners, and travel advice from the South Korean government. Um, otherwise, there will be problems either for the tourists and or the North Korean staff. And so I think we need to think about the preparation before people travel to North Korea on an individual tour and focus on that. And then lastly, to kind of end on a more positive note, I think we need to uh, focus on the opportunities after a tour. Um, to South Koreans or international visitors. And um, I think the, gover the government or educators and or civil society can play a big role in, in capturing kind of people's interests in North Korea. Um, right after the tour, that's when their interest is gonna be highest, when they wanna be involved in whether it be uh, further learning about North Korea or engaging with North Korea. Um, Dr. Lee mentioned volunteerism, um, so I think Part of our job is, again, to prepare tourists before they go on the trip and kind of um, think about how we can build on their travel experience afterwards. And I think that can make a meaningful uh, individual tourism to North Korea. And so those are my main three points, and I will end there. Oh, yeah, 감사합니다. Thank you very much. Uh, very valuable comments indeed. Uh, and. Uh, Uh, so uh, I think uh, basically he touched upon uh, are we really ready to um, um, pursue this uh, uh, individual uh, tourism? Uh, and he talked about some of the success factors. Thank you very much. Uh, there are actually many questions uh, that are coming in. So we will close uh, the uh, question uh, re reception uh, right now. Uh, also, there is the Inter-Korean Cooperation Association who can actually respond to some of the questions if we're not able to deal with them here today. So I would have to selectively choose the questions. So we have two questions for the two speakers. Uh, first, uh, for Professor Shim. Uh, I think it'll take a long time to answer, and uh, um, it is the North Korean Tourism um, Bureau that uh, uh, deals with the tourism in the North Korea. So is there a, a policy agenda for them for this year? And uh, the second question is a very direct question. Professor Shim, uh, you said that Kaiman uh, Wansan requires uh, the support of South Korea. Though why do you think they blew up uh, the joint liaison office? What is the attitude of North Korea? Why did they blow up uh, the liaison office? Uh, so if you could uh, provide answers to that. And then to Dr. Shin. 
Uh, bulk cash. What's the definition? What is uh, the threshold to be constitute bulk cash? Uh, for example, is a 100 million Korean won bulk cash spent by uh, one person, or if it's divided by 10 people, is that not bulk cash? And uh, uh, many people ask questions to uh, Dr. Min from KTO. On the KTO level, what uh, preparations are you making? And uh, uh, are there some ways that you can carry out uh, tourism activities via top down utilizing international organizations? And uh, questions to the Ministry of Unification. I will skip them. And uh, there's another question for Dr. Shim. Uh, UN sanctions are making the inter-Korean uh, tourism difficult. I think it's important to create an environment for private companies to participate. But a secondary boycott is uh, e even more serious, and it, NGOs and private sector companies uh, cannot, uh, may not participate uh, in the tourism activities, if, even if the Korean government allows it because of uh, these sanctions. And in that case, what are some ways uh, that uh, private companies and NGOs can participate in uh, North Korea tourism? And also a question to Mr. Lee. For North Korea, it's considered um, economic cooperation. And in Korea, we divide it into some that are economic cooperation and others that are social cultural cooperation efforts. So should we think of tourism as economic cooperation or cultural and social uh, exchange. And uh, there was a question from Koika to uh, Dr. Lee, uh, the volunteerism, could it be considered as ODA? And that in that case, should that be connected with Koika, volunteerism? Can that be connected as ODA and the Koika project, if you have any ideas to uh, enable that? And a question to Ban Pill. A uh, question on Korea tour. Korea tour. When you were selling North Korea pro uh, tourism products, I'm sure there were uh, tourist insurance. So what types of insurance uh, did you use? And uh, what uh, insurance companies did you utilize? What was uh, the premium for the insurance products? And so if you could give us some details on the insurance coverage, insurance uh, policies that you use, and the premiums, that will be helpful for NGOs considering this. And if you can give us uh, some uh, ideas on that, and we will give each of you two minutes, starting from uh, Professor Shim. So in order to respond to that, I think I would need at least three hours to give a full answer. But um, the, uh, the North Korea's Tourism Bureau W they have uh, shifted to uh, doing, you know, um, planning for tourism like a normal state. They're talking about uh, enhancing service quality, and they're also overseeing, uh, you know, various, uh, creating various opportunities like camping uh, and, you know, um, Airbnb type of thing, uh, bed, bed and breakfast type of thing. But um, they're saying that uh, they're willing to accommodate uh, different requests from tourism, but uh, initially uh, they are always watching uh, the leaders' uh, opinions. And so I don't know how much flexibility they can exercise. Now, with regards to uh, our facilities and uh, why was it blowing up in Kim Kaesong, well, I, I wish I knew the answer. We would have to ask Kim Jong-un or Kim Yo-jong uh, for the answer. So in negotiating with North Koreans, we really have to uh, kind of stand in their shoes. I guess 
they were thinking that the South Korean government was inactive, not really taking initiative enough. Uh, right now, uh, we are, the Unification Ministry is thinking uh, about having these tours via, via China, but then you would have to get dual visas. Uh, you know, you would have to pay at least $120 for a visa, and uh, only those people uh, who uh, have traveled uh, to China within a certain number of uh, months, uh, they would be given a, a longer-term visa. Uh, and so visa issue is one. And also, uh, if you were to go through Vladivostok, you don't need a visa uh, to go to Vladivostok. And if you use um, the app there, the taxi app, you know, it, it's possible to uh, utilize this place as a uh, transit uh, to uh, North Korea. So if the late Chong Ju Young, chairman of Hyundai Group, uh, were alive, he probably would have said, why don't we use a, a ship and uh, go by sea route? Because you don't need to get UN commands, um, you know, approval. Or if we can't go, I mean, we could have the North Korean vessels come down and pick us up. You know, I mean, you know, if you could think of creative ideas to solve the problems, there are ways. But uh, right now, it seems that we haven't been doing that uh, much creative thinking, at least not sufficiently. So um, I think that would have to be the end of my comments. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, we could hear more from you later on. Uh, it was a very um, interesting question. How much is bulk cash? Do you know? For me, it's a thousand dollars bulk cash for me. Do you think it's a million? I'm line for the definition of bulk cash. That is, makes it more difficult. Then. Because once there is a standard for what bulk cash is, you can avoid that. Uh, if you set it at $1 million, then the uh, $1 shy of $1 million will not constitute bulk cash. So that's why they do not have a clear guideline of what that bulk cash is. So it is a subjective matter. Just as uh, Dr. Lee said, uh, when do we were sending Tommy Flu, the truck cannot be sent. What do you mean then? Do we have to uh, hand carry it, not using uh, trucks? So it's a matter that people decide on on the standard of ball cash and uh, sending Tommy Flu. And that's why we said that the Korea-U.S. working group's role is important. And the second question is about one safe way in which uh, private sector and NGOs can to, uh, work in tourism with North Korea. I would like to know, too, business uh, safety or credibility is required. Uh, the Kaesong Industrial Conference uh, suddenly overnight uh, they had to leave their assets into Kaesong Industrial Site and come back to South Korea. So the business should not have to experience uh, um, such uh, disruptions. Chinese companies and uh, Chinese businesses, uh, businessmen in Singapore are asked to invest in North Korea, and Chinese companies are not investing in the PRK. That's because they have seen the experience of Hyundai Asan uh, that uh, such experiences um, lead to a situation in which North Korea has to show a serious attitude and uh, with one in what integrity they're willing to work with. Uh, Dr. Min, then, uh, just maybe one minute each. Uh, with regards to the tourism in North Korea, what are progress uh, made recently? A and also uh, the person asked for plans forward. Uh, well, based on the assumption that uh, tourism could resume this year, we had prepared plans for some pilot 
uh, programs uh, because it's a 30 year anniversary for reunification of Germany and so we were working trying to work with a German travel agency to uh, go to the Namhe German uh, village uh, to visit there that would be an event and uh, Russia the auto rally tour uh, actually that was done uh, a couple of years back and uh, we were trying to uh, maybe revive that idea and also we could we're thinking of organizing pilot tours for heads of travel agencies in China and so these were some of the pilot projects that we were thinking of assuming that we might be able to resume things but of course at the end of the day it's uh, you know whether or not DPRK is is willing to uh, welcome us uh, so nevertheless we will have to continue to prepare for the longer term opportunities and also we've been working with the local governments in the border area to come up with more specific ideas and it's very difficult at this time to disclose some of those ideas uh, and we have 32 overseas offices of uh, these we have some offices in Shenyang and Beijing and with these offices we are collecting information about North Korea and we also are exploring opportunities with Chinese travel agents specializing in North Korean tour and right now we're focused on DMZ related projects uh, uh, in October uh, from Imjingak we are thinking of doing a major performance utilizing digital technologies uh, and at Imjingak we are establishing a digital technology uh, experience uh, center which will be open next year and so we are also including there some contents related to North, North Korea and as for counterpart in North Korea well uh, we want to restore relations with the counterpart that we've been working on before things got suspended. With regards to MICE, of course, we are open to uh, the opportunities to uh, develop MICE. Uh, and uh, the suggestion here was to work with international organization to do a top-down approach to MICE uh, promotion. Uh, we're open to that. Uh, if it's possible, through Wonsan, Pyongyang, and maybe in Seoul uh, at Kintex Convention Center, we could do something simultaneously or we could do something uh, in the form of a web seminar and uh, themes could include uh, ecotourism or geology uh, it could be considered and if possible we want to uh, we're actually uh, working jointly to get a UNESCO designation uh, for DMZ uh, and so uh, I think that could be something on which the two Koreas can cooperate on. Any comments? Uh, please, um, responses to questions, please. Yes. Uh, the May uh, 24th measures are still uh, intact. And the May 24th measure is still intact. And there is sanctions against North Korea that's still um valid so it would be very difficult at this time to continue this as an economic cooperation so it would have to be a socio-cultural uh, cooperation and uh, we have been planning to promote tourism as a form of socio-cultural cooperation so for example we could have workshops uh inviting uh, you know leaders in different organizations related to tourism um, economic cooperation work with uh, north korea is it can be included as oda i think that the koika member is already aware that it requires reviewing of laws and regulations uh, and uh, the volunteerism, uh, the one that I thought about was eco tourism and uh, quarantine activities uh, and uh, the uh, water quality improvement activities might be considered. And uh, on the role of Kohika, if you can contact me personally, I will consider what can be done. So, um, 
James, Mr. James Balfour, please. So the uh, the insurance question is eternally a difficult one to answer. Um, it varies over time depending on the situation, and it depends both on your nationality mm. and your country of residence. So you really need to do your research. Mm. I'd briefly say it's most important to have the medical evacuation insurance. Um, actual medical expenses in North Korea are quite cheap. The big cost is going to be medical evacuation by flight. Um, so you really want to make sure to check with your insurance company to make sure that is covered out of all things um, and, and do your research as you would anywhere else. <laughs> Thank you very much. As uh, the moderator, I don't think uh, that uh, I allotted the time wisely because uh, in wrapping up, we did not have enough time, and I ask you for your understanding. And uh, many of the questions were related to myself and uh, to our association, the South North Korea Exchanges and Cooperation Support Association. We're always open, so uh, please uh, direct your questions to our association if you have any. Thank you for participating in our session. In this session, we uh, looked at uh, the infrastructure of North Korea's tourism and uh, what our challenges are and uh, what needs to be done to resume tour with North Korea. We have COVID-19 and uh, the uh, stalemate in the inter-Korean relationships. So we are living in uh, these difficult times. But in the near future, we hope that uh, tourism can resume on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, on the 15th of August this year, our president said that we would like to see the people that uh, we want to see before we die and to go to places that we want to go, and that is actual cooperation ex exchange. It is true that uh, with these restrictions, it will not be po easy to overcome the situation and individual tourism and some uh, exchanges you might doubt will lead to fundamental change. However, even if the times are tough, exchange and cooperation should be facilitated and we should put in efforts to this end. And individual tourism can be one way in overcoming uh, the situation and it might work as an important system in improving inter-Korean relations. And uh, we dream of a day where there can be free uh, tourism on the Korean Peninsula. With this, we will end uh, this session. I would like to thank the speakers, discussants, and uh, the uh, participants who are watching via online. Thank you very much. We will now end the session. Thank you.